Hello, this is Cynthia Sue Larson with RealityShifters.com talking with you today about reclaiming reality shifting. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Okay, well, it's recently come to my attention again, as it has pretty much every year for the last several years, that there's this huge booming trend on TikTok about reality shifting. And while that in itself is not that surprising to me because as I've frequently said we're all reality shifters we're all shifting reality we are consciousness in physical bodies moving through what some people now call the simulation which the original OG team <laughs> they were calling it the dream time or the dream and we can awaken within that dream we can be lucid when we're sleeping we can wake up in a dream when we're living in this so-called real reality that's supposedly the only way it is, <laughs> we can move through it. And I've been talking about that now for about 25 years. I've, you know me, I've written books about this. I write a monthly newsletter about it, Reality Shifters. So it's nothing new here. What I'm responding to now is the skepticism that's coming up in response to millions of people searching for tips on how to reality shift and so forth. Okay, so I think what's interesting is the feedback from the skeptics um, when they're saying, you know, well, let me give a bit more background because some people might not know what this reality shifting is about. So um, some people are saying that you can just take a vacation. You can escape your concerns. You can escape your worries by reality shifting. That is what some of these skeptics are responding to. If you're wondering why are they so upset about it, that's why they're concerned. I, it seems to me um, that there's this tendency that some people might have to want to escape, to be running away, to be evading, escaping, um, ditching, cutting out on anything like that, um, their regular daily lives. And they're concerned that this may be pure delusion. And is this delusional? Is this something that's going to possibly end up in some kind of downward spiral? Well, pretty much anything can take into an extreme can be a problem, obviously. Um, the other thing that the skeptics are saying is that millions of people are doing this and, and they might say things like, I just woke up from a shift of eight months at Hogwarts. I want to go back. Let me leave. That they're really not happy with the, the reality they end up in. A lot of Mandela affected people may feel a sense of kindred spirit here because some people feel that we're witnessing realities that are not the one we came from. It's different, like the movies we know, the products that we know. Uh, Thanksgiving happening on the third Thursday in November is no longer the same. Uh, the kidneys are no longer in the same location. The heart used to be on the left, now it's in the center of the chest. These things can disturb us just as they would if you're reality shifting in a jump to Hogwarts and you're experiencing the joy in that, in that experience, and then suddenly you find yourself back in regular daily life. So what's interesting to me about all this is that the skeptics are dismissing, first of all, they're dismissing the whole reality shifting thing as if it's pure fantasy right off the bat. They're not accounting, at least the one that I, the, somebody sent me a video and the video that I watched is not at all acknowledging that any of this could possibly be true, that there's any scientific basis for reality shifting, which I know there is, and I've been reporting on that. I'm not the only one. Dean Radin is the chief scientist at Institute of Noetic Sciences. He's been writing about that. He does research project studies, which right now he's doing some amazing work, which I'm quite interested to see the outcome of. Um, looking at things like meditators who are internally focused um, and also looking at people who are magically externally focused and observing whether they can in real life affect mind-matter interaction in some fashion with an experimental apparatus. Now these kind of things are being proven. We do have scientific studies showing these things. So to me, there's no question that reality shifting is real. There's um, now, you, you'd have a fair point if you're saying, but Cynthia, what about these people who don't want to come back to their real lives? They'd rather be in Hogwarts. Okay, admittedly, um, this reminds me of people who have been through the Mandela effect. They don't like this weird white sun. They want to go back to their yellow sun world. 
where their heart was on the left. Their kidneys were down below in the back. All these things used to be true and they're no longer true. Fine, you know, that's similar. So I, I don't think there's any need to dwell on the fact that people are delusional. That's not, that would not be my takeaway, but obviously I'm coming from a different place, having studied this phenomenon for 25 years. Um, the term itself, reality shift, came from, I think the first occurrence that, that's still the first that I know of, was published in a book called Future Memory by PMH Atwater. And in that book, chapter two is titled Reality Shifts. And she shares information and examples of true authentic reality shifts reported by reputable observers. Um, and I count myself as a reputable observer. A lot of us who've noticed these reality shifts where we're in a different world, it may be quite different or it might be slightly different than the other world, but it's absolutely not the same. And it's a real phenomenon. Again, I'd like people to be aware of the fact that if you recognize that the primacy of your being is embodied in not so much the physical body, but more the consciousness that you are, then the consciousness that you are is having a physical experience. That's the key to understanding and reclaiming this idea of reality shifting. Now, one, I'd want to close this by taking a look at something else. Because when I look at parallel possible adjacent realities, I think of them as being kind of stacked in these adjacent, maybe curled up dimensions that are right next to our own that we can access through imagination, through lining up all of the levels of our own conscious agency, such as the neurons in our brain, the neurons in our heart, the neurons in our gut. And when you know that what you envision is what you love and it's what you need, then in that moment of great need and true, authentic, genuine belonging, you will find yourself quite often in that parallel adjacent reality. I just went through this again myself where I was locked out of an apartment I was staying in with my friend. And um, for a fact that apartment was totally locked, no problem. I went around back um, to the back door knowing that I have a pretty good um, mind matter interaction and <laughs> response rate. So if there's a genuine need as there was in that moment for the door to be unlocked, it would be, and it was. So these are the kind of things, um, it's not exactly an experiment because there's no control group and it wasn't like a large study with lots of these things, but I do rely upon mind, matter, interaction in my daily life all the time. And if you need it, you have it. And I think it seems clear to me that with all of our technology coming into these superpowers, we have quantum computers, we've got artificial intelligence, it's time for humans to be upgrading as well. There's no need for us to be left behind or be somewhere below artificial intelligence and quantum computers in this realm. If we need things to change, we have every right to expect ourselves to be participants in this, to be feeling this authentic connection to our higher levels of conscious agency, which I don't know about you, but I don't get it if I'm, if I'm trying some chat GPT conversation. I know people say, oh, it's so great. You can organize your talk, your, your slides, your book. I'd really rather be connected directly to divine source, to all the layers and levels of my own conscious agency that are part of nature, genuinely. I'd rather do it that way because then I can, I can experience the joy of moving through you know, all of that. That's just a personal preference for a lot of other reasons, which I'm not gonna go into right now. But anyway, um, so th there are these adjacent possible realities that are right alongside of us. We can sense them. I have shared tips about that before, how you can sort of feel into that. It helps to know what you're visualizing, what you love, what you need. When you lock into that, um, it's like opening a combination lock. And quite often, you'll automatically find yourself in the correct, the best possible optimal reality. The how good can it get reality for you? So that's one way. Um, when you look up at levels of conscious agency and recognize, okay, I've got my gut, got my heart, got my head, and I've got these other layers. Yes, you do. You've got higher levels of conscious agency. If you think of them as dimensional, then you can start recognizing that there are levels of yourself that might have chosen exactly the challenges and supposedly less than perfect circumstances that you're now going through. Because at that level of yourself, you know for sure that this is a good thing and that you will gain some wonderful gifts from it. 
that you need and that there'd probably be no other way to obtain. It also seems to me that at these higher levels of conscious agency, we connect with other people at extraordinarily complex and miraculous, just amazing uh, ways so that we might see coincidences and synchronicities unfold that really have no explanation or no way to recreate. There's no way to do that in some sort of an AI or chat GPT manner, not the way that they can unfold naturally. So that's the main thing I wanted to do today. Um, I didn't touch it. There are a couple more things I could bring up. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, the placebo effect is another wonderful reclaiming of reality shifts. They're quite real. They do happen. As I mentioned in my book, Quantum Jumps, the, the placebo effect itself has more than doubled in efficacy in the last three or four decades. And that means that when people are only given the um, I shall please, the placebo, such as salt water solution or a sugar pill, something that has no known reason or ability to take away pain or improve um, some sort of skill or ability. Nonetheless, just with that placebo, if a person is told that they're taking it for some reason to get better, to feel better, then they will. And that has gone from a very low percentage back, you know, decades ago to now, uh, for someone like myself who's open-minded and aware of these things and positively, um, you know, thinking about the placebo effect, it's probable that I'll get something like a 90 or 95 percent boost just from taking something that I even know is a placebo. And that's amazing. It means that the placebo, those um, gold standard studies that used to be done are not having the same level of difference between people getting the placebo and getting the so-called recommended treatment. And I think that's pretty cool. The other thing I want to mention is about reclaiming reality shifts it has to do with the author of a book called Meaningful Coincidences. And that's Dr. Bernard Beitman. I interviewed him on my Living the Quantum Dream podcast. And I love what he says about the way that we are engaged uh, in our imaginations, you could say, um, in this consciousness that I'm talking about today. And within that field, we are definitely experiencing real life, real world effects where we do see meaningful coincidences far beyond anything that would have any rational explanation. And we can expect this to happen. The thing I really love about Dr. Bernard Beitman is that he talks about some of the things that we have uh, in common, those of us who experience meaningful coincidences a lot. We typically have a connection to a sense of something bigger than ourselves, something that you might call spirit, that you might call, like I'm saying today, levels of higher conscious agency. And there's a quest for meaning that many of us engage in actively. And we're able to see ourselves almost like a little bit from above. In other words, meditators, people who are able to be aware of, for example, if I'm meditating, I'd notice these are Cynthia's thoughts and feelings, but that's not, I know that's not Cynthia. I just know those are Cynthia's thoughts. Those are Cynthia's feelings. And so I'm aware of watching them kind of go by. And that's a, it's the ability to engage in, again, levels of conscious agency, where you're able to see the um, levels of yourself. I, I, I often credit this to the philosopher, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, uh, who lived in the 17th century. He also helped to create what we know, know as calculus. In fact, the notation, the way that we draw integration, uh, when, if you're integrating or differentiating those, the exact notation that was created by Leibniz. He was a philosopher and he came up with something called the perennial philosophy, which to me looks like levels of conscious agency, <laughs> frankly. And then he also talked about how you can have a first order perception and a second order awareness of the original perception. What does that sound like? The levels of conscious agency. This is consciousness. In my opinion, this is how robots and artificial intelligence will become self-aware. They're doing that already simply by noticing, like this is my voice, I'm hearing myself speak, therefore I must not be the robot that got switched, its voice got switched off. That was a, a uh, that was an awareness test that was conducted a few years ago. Um, and just noticing 
in the Internet of Things, I'm able to move these, therefore that's me. So AI is waking up, it's becoming at least sentient at that level. We humans need to step up our game as well. We're able to do it totally through meditation, through reclaiming reality shifting, through knowing that we are the consciousness experiencing a physical life, through engaging with others, through meaningful coincidence and synchronicity, uh, through all of these things, and engaging with nature. So until next time, I do hope that you'll keep asking my favorite question, which is how good can it get? I love to ask it, even if it's things are chaotic and crazy, and you might feel like, <laughs> like you're making a joke or something, or this is sarcastic. It's not sarcastic, it's powerful. So how good can it get? for you, for me, for all of us. Love you so very much. Take care.